So hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't, is this working? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. So my name is uh, uh, Dana Kistner. I'm a pulmonologist. Been, I'm the oldest pulmonologist in the Wayne State program and been so for a long time. Um, that's when uh, Dr. Bowles left. Uh, and um, I, uh, right now, the Detroit Health Department runs its TB uh, clinic. Um, and operations through uh, Wayne State's uh, University Physician Group. We're located on 50 East Canfield, um, and I'm the medical director. Um, so I'm going to be talking today. I got asked to talk about um, tuberculosis treatment, and I thought that I would just limit this to the updated recommendations, which are it's a very extensive document that was published. Um, and even limiting it to that, um, I'm going to be leaving out a lot of what they um, have in that uh, that document. I'm going to start with a case, and I have this case uh, which came to me through a, a local institution, um, and another case that was a Detroit Medical Center case, which I'm only going to just show you his x-ray, and then I'm going to refer to him um, as I go through the treatment recommendations. And I want to emphasize here, this is a pulmonary group, and I know that the younger pulmonologists are not taking care of TB patients for the most part. Um, on their own, even in the hospital or in the clinics. They send them to infectious disease a lot. So I know your interest is not necessarily going to be you know, to, for the treatment regimens, but I think where uh, pulmonary still um, plays a major role is having a patient come in with symptoms and uh, maybe an abnormal chest x-ray, and those patients are coming to pulmonary. And I think it's really important for you to know when to think about tuberculosis and what to do when you do think about it. Um, because too often what we're seeing is uh, cases that to me, when I look back at uh, what was done by the pulmonologist, I say, what were these guys thinking? Why didn't they treat this patient for tuberculosis before it got so out of hand? And I think that's where I'm going to try to direct some of my comments to. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the uh, first case. This was a 64-year-old man, a lifelong resident of Detroit. Uh, and by the way, about only one-third of our cases of tuberculosis in the country right now are people who were born in the United States. Two-thirds are from people who were born in other countries. And then there is probably a, another group of patients that have lived in other countries, even though they weren't born there. Anyway, he, he's a Detroit resident. Um, he had some kind of cognitive impairment that was lifelong. He had a family guard, has a family guardian, and an additional male, an additional male support person, because his guardian is um, disabled on her own. He lives alone. Um, he's had caregivers in the house, but they don't last very long. And he drinks beer with his buddies all day, every day, and that's his main activity. Um, he smokes a half a pack of cigarettes a day, and he has done so since age 12. And that's a risk factor for tuberculosis. Um, so he was ill for six months um, and then uh, presented um, to a pulmonologist. But he uh, presented with a decreased appetite, 30-pound weight loss, um, a cough that was more recent. Um, and starting in June of the year that uh, he was seen, um, he was uh, begun to be worked up. And uh, this was one of his uh, x-rays uh, from that time when he, when he showed up in June. And I hope that you can see he's, he's clearly got some emphysematous changes. And he's got an ill-defined patchy density or infiltrate in the left lower lobe. I'll just put that back again. Um, I don't know. I don't have too many x-rays. That shows okay on the uh, screen? Okay. Um, so in July, so he was seen in a pulmonologist's office, and uh, in July he had a CT scan that is shown over here. Um, and you can see he had bilateral disease, um, the left lower lobe um, area, and then a small, what you might call a nodule in the right um, the lower lung field. And then um, he was followed, I think he was given some antibiotics if I remember correctly, and he was uh, brought back in, and uh, he had another CT scan. And this time I'm going to point out this uh, tree and bud uh, densities. And you can see them up there. Um, and the, the, the densities are pretty much in the same location, but they certainly have changed. 
Um, and I know that these are just individual cuts. I'm not showing you the whole CT just to make this a little bit simpler. And I want to say beware of radiologists and beware of two things that radiologists seem to universally say that tend to bring people's minds off of tuberculosis. The first thing is, is they love this expression called atypical infection. Uh, which I have no idea what it means because every time they have a case of TB, they call it an atypical infection. Um, when they see tree and bud, they love to say atypical mycobacteria. Uh, and tree and bud is a very typical x-ray finding for tuberculosis. Um, it is no more typical of non-tuberculous mycobacteria than it is of uh, tuberculosis. Um, and this is a good example of that. So he had a bronchoscopy because he wasn't got, getting better. He had a transbronchial biopsy with washings. Um, the <coughs> specimen was sent for uh, tuberculosis, and the acid fast stain was negative, as it frequently is in bronchoscopic um, uh, material. Uh, but almost two months later, there was growth of MTB reported. Um, and um, he was referred to the TB clinic at that point. The lab reports him out to the uh, health department, and we saw him on 12-7. Uh, By that time, he was absolutely emaciated. He looked like he came out of a concentration camp. He couldn't get out of a chair. He weighed 115 pounds. Um, we collected sputum for AFB and, cult and culture, and uh, they were all positive and we began his uh, treatment for tuberculosis. And I love, I, re I published a paper when I first started a couple of years outside of my fellowship when I was at Wayne County Hospital, which used to take care of a lot of the TB in southeastern Michigan. And we had lots and lots of cases in those days that came in. And I had a habit of going back and looking at old x-rays. And I almost always could find the TB on old x-rays before the, uh, the current diagnosis. And I still do that. So I went back and I got old x-rays on him. And sure enough, he had something a year before presentation. So I call this a man with many x-rays and many CTs and no diagnosis. It was just repeated, repeated, repeated. Um, so I think these are missed opportunities. And that's where I think pulmonary um, plays a big role. So I'm going to turn now to the document that I'm going to review. And these were the treatment guidelines um, that were published by the IDSA, um, by the ATS, um, and by the CDC. Uh, the TB treatment guidelines for drug susceptible disease published in August of 2016. Um, they used grade methodology. And for those of you who don't know what grade methodology is, I'm going to give you an example a little bit later when I talk about directly observed therapy versus self-administered therapy. So these were developed by the three organizations I just men mentioned. But they had participants from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the World Health Organization. And they had endorsement by the European Respiratory Society and the US National TB Control Controllers Association, uh, of which I'm a member. Now, the um, situations to which the guidelines apply are actually quite narrow. So they want this to apply in wealthier areas, uh, resource-rich areas, uh, where you're able to culture the uh, sputum or whatever other specimen you have, um, where you're able to do drug susceptibility studies, either phenotypically or molecular, and I'm showing you the gene expert here. Um, do you guys know what the gene expert is? OK, you have to know what the gene expert is. This, is, this would be a great board question. Um, so the gene expert is, is, is available in, in very resource poor areas around the world. Um, but in the Detroit area, Oakwood has um, the gene expert. But I'm not sure that any other hospital really has it. Um, but what you do is you cough up the sputum, you put it in what looks like a printer cartridge, you stick it in the machine, and in less than two hours it will spit out um, two uh, molecular studies. One is whether they see M tuberculosis, and the other is whether they see RPOB, uh, which is the uh, rifampin resistance mutation gene. And so it will tell you right away, um, it's like a PCR. We're seeing the MTB complex, um, and yes or no, we see the resistance gene that accounts for about 95% of rifampin resistance. Um, so if a country or a setting has this, 
then it will be acceptable for these guidelines. Now, this is talking about TB disease. It's not talking about latent TB infection. And because you are very frequently making decisions for treatment before you have any susceptibility studies, um, you're, you're limited to those where you are not suspecting drug resistance um, or where you already know that the organism is drug susceptible. And this is my emphasis, and, but it's not my statement. Um, it's the diagnosis of TB and the decision to treat often occur before diagnosis is confirmed and drug susceptibility is known. Diagnosis of TB and decision to treat. And another thing that I see way too often is I'm waiting for the proof that this is TB. And you really should not be doing that. It's just an absolutely wrong thing to do. Uh, because what you have is then you do multiple studies and you repeat them and you repeat them and you repeat them and then finally the disease becomes contagious and easy to diagnose and then you say, okay, now I have TB and that's just not a good, good approach. Um, so, uh, and the, the guidelines also uh, not only talk about clinical treatment but public health management. So, the initial decision to treat for TB disease. So, anybody think this looks like TB? You guys seen enough TB? These are just empty spaces. These are cavities. They are teeming with TB organisms. They have a direct tunnel or bridge or railroad train track right through to the main stem bronchi and right out to the trachea and right out to everybody in the same room with this patient. And at the same time, all that TB that's going up into the trachea is being aspirated into multiple parts of the lung. So this is extensive um, destructive tuberculosis. What is this guy's, um, why is he in the hospital? He's in the hospital for about his 10th time over a year and a half where his x-ray is getting worse and worse and worse. He's an active IV drug user. He's homeless. Um, he... Uh, has associations with alcoholics, um, so he has all the Detroit risk factors for tuberculosis. So we have him now, and he gets critically ill, he's put into the ICU, he gets intubated, and he gets a bronchoscopy. So this is case number two. Um, so and I'm going to refer to this case and case number one. So before TB disease is confirmed or drug susceptibility is known, you have to make a decision to treat. And it's based on clinical factors. Radiographic findings, so I'm just saying this is a, a radiographic finding that there's almost nothing else but TB. Laboratory data, we don't have any yet on this, but patient factors. Every patient with TB comes with a context. Um, was he a refugee in a, is he a refugee from uh, Yemen who spent time um, in Djibouti, um, very high risk group for um, TB in the Detroit area. Is he from Bangladesh? <coughs> Bangladesh just published a story, in the, a, a, an article um, in one of the major journals, and what they did is they went into their hospitals and they looked for TB. They were actually looking for TB, and lo and behold, they found out lots and lots and lots of people had TB in there that nobody was thinking about TB. And we have a big Bangladeshi population. Um, other places, Syria, Iraq, refugee camps, think about TB. Um, we have a patient at uh, Detroit Receiving Hospital right now, um, undiagnosed back pain, fever, weight loss um, that's due to tuberculosis, delayed diagnosis because his symptoms weren't put in context. Um, and then there's public health issues. When you have a case like this, um, this is a menace to everybody around this patient. So a year and a half before uh, the DMC made a diagnosis on this case. So this is now quotes uh, from this article. And they're finally saying this right up front, something that I think I've been saying for many years. So in addition, clinical judgment and the index of suspicion for TB are critical in making a decision to initiate treatment. In patients who have a high likelihood of having TB or are seriously ill with a disorder suspicious for TB, empiric treatment with a four-drug regimen should be initiated promptly, even before the results of AFB smear microscopy, molecular tests, and cultures are known. 
If you have any doubt, call your local health department based on where the patient lives. If you have any doubt and the patient lives in Detroit, Hamtramck, Highland Park, or the Gross Points, call me. And I, and I will tell you, you know, we'll probably take over the case and say, yes, we think this is TB, or we don't think it's TB. Don't let this patient just, you know, go on and on and on. So I'm going to add, this is my editorial, absolutely do not forget to collect sputum for AFB, smear, and culture, best done first thing in the morning, or other appropriate specimens, and do it before you do bronchoscopy. The um, sister article uh, that was also published uh, late in 2016 is the diagnosis of tuberculosis. And in that guideline, they specifically say bronchoscopy is not the procedure of choice. Um, that sputums are better, um, they're better able to make the diagnosis. Now, there are some patients who you absolutely, you know, a comatose patient who you can't get to cough um, is somebody that you might want to go down with a bronchoscopy, but most patients will cough up sputum, especially first thing in the morning. I just pulled this off the web, and the other thing that we rely on too much is induced sputum. Spontaneous morning sputum is more desirable than induced sputum. You're more likely uh, to get some uh, information from that. So if you really think this person is sick, um, you're really convinced the person has TB, collect those sputums, and then start the patient on your TB drugs. So, um, any, any, any comments or questions at this point, by the way? Every once in a while I need to stop being motor mouth. Yeah? The, uh, the sputum samples, they take three, uh, at least one should be sent to molecular testing out of whichever sam number of samples that we take? Yeah, I don't want to do too much on, on the uh, diagnosis of TB, but that's a really good question. Um, you know, the current guidelines in this new guideline diagnosis of tuberculosis is um, going back to the original recommendation of the CDC, which is not every, you know, you don't always need to, um, so when you're, you're going to be testing an awful lot of people that don't have TB. And it's really not necessary to send all of those sputums for nucleic acid amplification test, or what you guys generally call PCR. Um, but where you think it's going to affect your, um, your management of the patient, yes. If you really have a low suspicion and you're doing this just to make sure and it's not going to affect your management, you probably don't need to do that. Um, but if you're, if you're AFB smear positive, um, you, and you really have some sus real suspicion for TB, you absolutely should be doing that. Let's say you really think that this is a non-tuberculous mycobacteria. You know, you really are not doing it for TB. Or you've already had somebody who's grown out MAC and you just want to see if they still have MAC. You know, you may not need to do that. So, uh, not everyone needs to do that. Yeah. I, d I don't want to get too, you know, side... I'll come back for a diagnosis if you want to, the diagnosis uh, document. But you know, The dilemma that I've had is like this new standard, you should start treatment if you're pretty sure mm -hmm. they have it. And you know, the, in our suburban area, we have these individual, like the community uh, health centers where they have like their own quote ID specialists, whatever. And you know, I've had patients where a couple of them not too long ago that convinced they had TB, send them over to get the medications for free, I'll send over the x-rays and other things, what, what I have there, let's get them started while we wait for stuff to come back. And then they show it to their doctor and says, I don't think this is indicated. And we get, end up losing like a week. So apparently some of these guys out there... Yeah, the health departments, that's really what the health departments are. And you, you actually, the, the regulations say that you are supposed to report suspected TB cases. So you're just following the regulations. You're not stepping on anybody's toe. You yeah, just, just quote the regulations. I, if I'm starting TB treatment with a suspected TB case, the health department is supposed to be notified. So that, that takes care of that problem. <laughs> yeah, we, we have this. So what I did is, um, this is just a, a, a screenshot of one of their diagrams, because they have a whole section on the decision for treatment, which I thought was wonderful, although I didn't really like the way they produced this. It's a little difficult to read. Um, and then I did things like circle things and put pictures in here. Um, and so this is kind of, a, a, I think, a, a nice way of looking at things. So if you go down to the bottom of the screen, you're going to see to the right, everything to the, to, I mean, to, to your left, yeah, to the left, um, everything to the left of that dotted line 
is going to favor treatment in a case where you don't have a firm diagnosis yet. And everything to the right of that dotted line is going to be favoring uh, no treatment. And then you have to look at the same factors that we just looked at on the slide, sl slides before. The patient factors, the laboratory and radiographic factors, um, the clinical status and suspicion. And I put there a miliary TB child, okay? That is a patient who can die very quickly and you want to get treatment on very quickly. Um, so that's an example of that. Um, and then the public health issues. And I'm going to refer to patient one and to refer to patient number two, okay? So, um, so going up at the top, so favoring treatment initiation, the favor. Risk for progression or dissemination, definitely patient number two, but not for patient one. Um, but uh, the progression, I think, has already happened. Um, the lay age less than two years, those are the kids that disseminate their tuberculosis very quickly and develop meningitis and uh, sepsis and miliary tuberculosis, and a lot of them have morbidity for life and uh, the mortality is high. And that's why we give BCG, to the vaccine, to newborn children in countries where there's a lot of TB, because it tends to prevent that. It doesn't prevent infection but it prevents the dissemination. So you really want to get those kids on treatment quickly, and sometimes you, you, know, you just don't even have time to get specimens or they're hard to get. Um, so um, that's why age less than two years old. The TB exposure risk, um, both of my patients were in high risk for having been exposed to tuberculosis. And then to the right, um, elevated concern for adverse treatment events. Um, drug drug interactions. The patient may have um, AIDS, and the AIDS is well controlled. The CD4 count is very high, um, but you're going to really have trouble with the rifamycins. Um, you know, the people who are on methadone programs uh, where they have uh, rifamp and methadone um, interactions. And the ones that have really no TB exposure risk, so you really don't think they're probably going to have TB. And then the radiographic imaging, in the next section, uh, consistent with TB, um, do you have evidence of MTB infection? And you really should be doing a TB skin test or an IGRA. Um, how much time is it going to be for you to have microbiologic uh, confirmation or even the rapid molecular test? So you get, uh, you know, one plus AFB on a Friday morning. And by the time you get that out to the state lab and they do their molecular test, it's going to be a while, so you might want to start that patient right then. Um, AFB smear being positive and the rapid molecular test positive in, in our labs around here, that's a diagnosis of TB. Um, but the AFB smear negative and the test positive is probably also, it's a very specific test. And then the granuloma. So my first case there had a transbronchial biopsy that showed granulomas, and nothing was done about that. Um, that patient should have had an IGRA. Um, his IGRA was positive, his QFT was positive, and he should have been treated. He should have had the sputum collected, and he should have been treated at that point. Um, and then uh, going down to, um, over to the right, so if you don't think the x-ray looks like TB, the AFB smear is positive, but your nucleic acid amplification test is negative, that's unlikely to be TB, um, and uh, you probably don't need to do anything um, in any case. If the AFB smear is negative and the um, nucleic acid amplification test is, al is also negative, that still can be TB because the sensitivity is only about 70%. Um, and then uh, going down to the clinical status, I mentioned the life-threatening disease. Um, both my second patient and these miliary TB patients fit there. Clinically stable, uh, I'm going to the right, symptoms not typical of TB and an alternative diagnosis, you're going to tend not to treat. And then public health, obviously patient two was a public health issue. And patient one became a public health issue because his sputums were all positive by the, by the time he came to me. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, treatment regimens, unless there's any questions about treating when you, you know, before you have proof that it's TB. Okay, nothing? Okay. So they're recommending four basic regimens. Um, and on this slide, I have what all the regimens have in common. 
Um, they all start with an eight-week intensive phase involving isoniazid, rifampin, PZA, and ethambutol. To wake you guys up, when is ethambutol not needed? Nope, 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 because you still have 4%. It's when you have the drug susceptibility tests, okay, and, and sometimes you have that, and sometimes we do. The health department, by the way, um, we have a way to go through the CDC and get the uh, molecular testing for drug resistance, so we'll get that right away. And as soon as we have it, we drop the ethambutol. Um, and it's in that bullet over here, so you should have cheated. <laughs> Just want to keep you guys awake. Okay, and then there's an 18-week, so remember that for your boards. If you know that there's a thambutol, if, if you know that the, the, the bug is sensitive, you don't need a thambutol in that, in that, uh, first, you know, that first regimen. So then you have an 18-week continuation phase, which is only isoniazid and rifampin. Um, and the difference between these guidelines and prior guidelines is they say that daily therapy is considered most effective and is the preferred regimen. Now, when they say daily, that could be five days a week by directly observed therapy or seven days a week by self-administered therapy. Those are equivalent. And as long as you have it daily during those five days and it's directly observed, then that's considered daily therapy. So that is their regime regimen that they think is uh, the best. Uh, the dosing, adult dosing, begins at age 15, and it's a little bit different for children than it is for, um, for adults. And uh, for dosing by weight, um, you should use the actual weight for non-obese patients. But for obese patients, you can... Um, uh, first of all, obese is defined as 20% uh, above ideal body weight for this dosing. You can use the ideal body weight for obese patients, but you may risk underdosing the patient. So alternatively, what you can do is the ideal body weight and then add to it 0.4 of the difference between the patient's weight and the ideal body weight, which is that formula down there. So that's a, a, a handy thing to do. You need to get in and have one of those apps that will give you immediately what the ideal body weight is. Um, I don't like what pharmacy does in any of the hospitals, including Henry Ford, because we get really wild dosing sometimes. Um, it's really hard to take rifampin capsules that come in 300 milligrams and 150 and turn it into um, 275. It's really difficult to do that. So I like to do it this way. The rifampin is usually two of the 300 milligram capsules, almost in every adult. Um, isoniazid shown there is 300 milligrams, um, and almost in every adult, that's what the isoniazid dose is. And then the PZA and the ethambutol, um, whatever number of pills for one, it's going to be the same thing for the other unless you have renal insufficiency. So if the person is between 55 and 75, it's like this. Um, if they're over 75 kilos, then you add one to the PZA and ethambutol. And if it's under 55, like me, um, I get to take less pills. I only take two each of those. Um, another thing is, is that we are probably underdosing rifampin because there is a dose response curve. And rifampin does better if you increase the dose. And there are studies going on now to put the rifampin dose actually up to double what is over here. Um, so for people who are really sick, that's a consideration to do. Busy slide. I'm going to walk you through this. These are the four regimens. Um, it's not as bad as it looks, I, I promise you. Um, so we have an intensive phase and a continuation phase. And I'm going over this because I want you not to memorize all this. Um, I don't have it memorized, and I use it frequently. Um, but what I want you to do is to have some idea when the health department calls and tells you that the patient that you just had admitted to the hospital is getting such and such drug, you know, that they've been on treatment for so long, so that you have some idea of what we're talking about. Uh, because that happens frequently. You get a patient who's already on TB drugs. And what I see is that the patient has already been on an intermittent regimen, 
and you guys put the patient on an intermittent regimen, but instead of increasing the isoniazid to 900 milligrams, you have the patient on 300 milligrams. And then you keep the patient in the hospital for two weeks, and that's two weeks I have to make up for at the other end of the treatment, because it's not the right treatment. Um, so let me walk you through this. So all of the drugs are the same uh, for all four. So that's real easy, and I just went over those. Now, the intensive phase, the preferred regimen is daily for eight weeks. And remember I said five days a week by DOT is the same as seven days a week by um, SAT. And we count the doses. So every dose that we give the patient, we do all our patients by, by DOT, and we count the doses. When we make, make it up to that dose, that's when we finish. If the patient doesn't miss a dose, it's in that eight-week frame period. Um, now, regimen number two is the same. That makes it easy. Um, regimen one, three, um, and by the way, this is in order of which they prefer the regimens to be. So this is their preferred one. Number two is the next preferred. This is the next one that's okay. And this one they really don't like, but you, it's okay sometimes. So here you go to three times a week. And you must increase the doses. So for three times a week or two times a week, the PZA and the ethambutol doses are going to change, and they're going to go up. Uh, Rifampin's going to stay the same, and the isoniazid it almost always goes to 900 milligrams. Number four is seven days a week for 14 doses. Um, and so you've got the usual PZA and ethambutol doses, and then followed by two times a week for 12 doses, and the doses really are different again from the three times a week. So that's the intensive phase. Now, for number three, they don't really like this when the patient has HIV or cavitary disease. If the patient misses a dose, you get treatment failure, you get relapse, and you get drug resistance. And for number four, they say don't use an HIV, period. Um, and when AFB smears are positive, you shouldn't use it. And when you have cavitary disease, you shouldn't do it. So for the two patients that I presented, you shouldn't do this, this regimen. Now the continuation phase, um, I'm really not going to go through this, um, but you're now down to just isoniazid and rifampin. And I want to highlight just some of the things, some of them that I, I've already said. Ethambutol is not needed if the TB is sensitive to isoniazid and rifampin. And then um, if you are using the five days a week, it must be by DOT. And then I mentioned the dose changes uh, when you do intermittent dosing, except for rifampin, and that two days a week is different from three. And then um, over here, I think I mentioned this already. So any questions about that? Those are the regimens that are accepted. They have to be changed for intolerances, for allergies, for, you know, other, other reasons. Any questions? Comments? Okay. Uh, how many of you guys know that there are certain circumstances when six months is not sufficient therapy? Okay. So, so this is familiar to you. So they're recommending uh, nine months of therapy if you have cavitation on chest x-ray and the sputum that you've collected at eight weeks is still culture positive. This is another area where we have trouble when our patients come into the hospital on treatment and they miss that eight weeks. And we ask you, please collect a sputum at eight weeks because then we don't know if the patient fits into this category. And what happens is we need to give them an extra three months of therapy when they get discharged if you miss this deadline for us, okay? Um, now, if you have either cavitation or positive cultures eight weeks and HIV or other immune suppression, uh, the patient is 10% below ideal body weight, is actively smoking or has diabetes, or has extensive disease like my patient number two, um, then you should consider, but you don't necessarily have to extend it out to nine months. So those are the categories here. Um, and by the way, diabetics have much worse prognosis in treating tuberculosis as do uh, current smokers, like my patient number one. I'm not going to go over this slide. I just, uh, we get a lot of phone calls, hey, this patient stopped taking his drugs, what do we do now? 
And they have a very nice discussion of that and a very nice slide that walks you through it. So I just want you to know that it's in that document, uh, what to do if the patient has interrupted therapy. Now I want to go to DOT versus SIT, and I want to go through this methodology of this um, article. So they do what are called PICO questions. Um, so the questions deal with what patient pro po um, population are, are you doing or what problem. So the problem right now is people with TB who are suspected of um, not being drug resistant. <clears throat> or we may have a very specific population, such as an HIV positive patient with such and such. <clears throat> and then you want the intervention. The intervention is here, here is how do I give the medicine? How do I actually get the medicine into the patient? Um, the comparison is going to be DOT versus SAT. And what is the outcome that I have gotten from my, um, from my uh, study? So um, this is, again, the grade method methodology. And I'm going to walk you through the DOT and SAT, uh, what they came up with. So their question is, does SAT have similar outcomes compared to DOT? And their recommendation, we suggest using DOT rather than SAT for routine treatment of patients with all forms of tuberculosis. So this is probably going to go to you. Okay, so now you've got tuberculosis where the laboratory hasn't reported this as being positive. So as soon as the laboratory reports positive uh, TB or even positive nucleic acid amplification test, the laboratory reports it to the state, it goes into the state system, and we have an obligation to go through that reporting, and we find our cases. And we will find you, and we will chew you out if you have been treating a patient with culture-negative TB um, or somebody that you're treating for tuberculosis, and you're doing it by SAT. So that's another thing. You see, patients need to be treated by DOT. So you can kind of say, well, I've got to report that to the health department because the standard is, and you go back to this document, that all forms of TB, extrapulmonary or not, are treated with DOT. Okay? And if you can't give them DOT, you really don't have a leg to stand on when that patient gets sick and doesn't do well. So please report these um, to the health department. Um, and then they have what's called conditional recommendation and low certainty in the evidence. So another, I just want you to understand what this means. So they do this from the point of view of the patients, the clinicians, and the policy makers. And they have strong recommendation or conditional recommendation. Or no recommendation. They don't recommend it. So there's two points where they recommend it. And then there's another one where they say we don't recommend it that I don't have on this table. So a strong recommendation, most reasonable people except Donald Trump would want this. Okay? A small number of people like Donald Trump would not because they're going to be contrarians. They're going to just say no. Um, most clinicians, um, excuse me, um, the clinicians say that most patients should receive this. Um, and adherence to this recommendation could be used as a quality criterion or a performance indicator in whatever program you have. And decision for the patients may not, AIDS may not be necessary. And then from policyholders, they could go right ahead. If it's a strong recommendation, you can go right ahead and say, in the city of Detroit, we're going to have this as our policy. A conditional recommendation is a majority of patients would want this, but many would not. Um, maybe some of his cabinet members. Um, the clinicians would be different choices, may be appropriate for different individuals. Um, so for DOT, for instance, you know, the person who is working uh, 10 hours a day um, doing housekeeping and gets assigned to that housekeeping job every day before the sun comes up, and it doesn't look good for the health department to go walking into a suburban house where the person's doing, how, you know, this may not be appropriate for that person. We can, we can think about it. And then you must help each person reach a decision based on his or her values and preferences, and decision aids may be useful. And policy making may require debate and involvement of stakeholders. So that's where these recommendations are when we say conditional. 
So I want to move on to special circumstances, um, and HIV is a big one. Uh, not an easy uh, thing to do to treat HIV and TB. And there are obvious unique issues with, um, th with the combination of TB and HIV. Uh, the main one is, or one of the main ones, is the drug-drug interactions between the uh, rifamycins and the, um, uh, the art. And I just want to just refer you, it's a wonderful table here. If you want to go to a really up-to-date table, uh, what you do in terms of uh, treating with the antiretroviral uh, drugs um, and the rifamycins. Um, and then there are paradoxical reactions that might suggest that the patient is worse, the immune re uh, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, or IRIS. Um, and by the way, paradoxical reactions occur very frequently in people without AIDS also, without HIV. Um, so that, that does occur in people without HIV. It just has nothing to do with the um, ART. Um, and then there's a greater potential for developing resistance to rifamycins, especially with these intermittent regimens. <clears throat> so just highlight that. So what are the recommendations? Um, so those who are already on antiretroviral therapy, they want you to use the regimen number one for six months. You don't have to extend that out to nine months unless they have the criteria that everybody else has, you know, like their sputum cultures are still positive at eight weeks and they've got cavities and so on. For people who are not ever expected to receive art during their TB therapy, um, they do want you to extend the therapy to nine months. And those are recommendations 5A and 5B. I'm going to go through the PICOS questions at the end. And when I get to this PICOS 5, I'm going to say, just go refer back to this slide. Um, and then the recommendations for 5A and B are conditional with very low certainty in the evidence. There's really not good evidence for this. It's pretty hard to do these studies with the nine months versus six months. So when do you start antiretroviral therapy? And this has been um, an evolving topic, and this is the latest um, recommendation uh, from this point of view. So if the CD4 is less than 50, begin the antiretroviral therapy within two weeks of starting your TB therapy. So now they're recommending, um, you know, you start your TB therapy, make sure the patient tolerates the TB therapy. And I would almost say as soon as they're tolerating the drugs a couple of days, go right ahead and start your, you know, your, uh, your antiretroviral therapy. If the CD4 count is greater than 50, you want to begin it by 8 to 12 weeks after starting TB therapy. And it's going to depend. We just had a patient um, who turns out probably not to have TB or MAC. We don't know what he has. Um, but he, uh, he had an indeterminate, he's, he's got a newly diagnosed AIDS. And he was started on antiretroviral therapy. And the CD4 went from 76 to 350, literally in a matter of two to three weeks. Um, and at the same time, he started to develop fevers, and he has little tiny cavities on his x-ray. He's four plus positive AFB on four, four sputums, and his quantifier on gold was indeterminate. Um, and he was started on, um, um, he was already on his antiretroviral therapy, and when we started his TB drugs, boy, did he get sick. Um, he, but he doesn't have TB. We don't know what he has. Um, so for TB meningitis, what happens in meningitis, and this is true for people with AIDS and without AIDS, if you have, for instance, a tuberculoma, um, you frequently, the CNS is a place where there are frequent paradoxical reactions, um, including iris. And so if you start to um, treat the patient with antiretroviral therapy, um, you're going to have an expansion of a mass-occupying lesion. And that can be very serious in patients. Um, these illnesses in the CNS are vascular lesions. People can have strokes because they get worse, and, and the, whatever is happening has a greater space, and then all of a sudden you have um, somebody who has a stroke uh, because you added the antiretroviral therapy. So look what they're recommending. Do not start antiretroviral therapy until 8 to 10 weeks after 
TB treatment is completed no matter what the CD4 count is. So I want that to sink in if you have people in the ICU and you're taking care of them because this can be absolutely catastrophic for the patients. Well, this is this is this is this chart is on when to start antiretroviral therapy. The recommendations that they had prior to that are really not, you know, they don't have. I I have there is an appendix on this document which I haven't gone over, and I don't know in the appendix. It's a long document to get rid of. I mean, to read through <laughs> to get rid of, to read through. Um, even without the appendix. And I don't know how much evidence there is, you know, on people. How much evidence is there on meningitis? What do you do with the art when they're already on it? Uh, so I, I think they just, I don't think they comment on it. Good question. So here's the first one. Recommendation is strong with high confidence in the evidence. So here they've got good evidence. So I think this is, a, this is something to remember. You're doing ICU work. This is an ICU kind of thing. Um, so try to remember the content of this slide. If I, I would say that to a fellow who's, who's you know, going to be doing boards. So special circumstances. Here's another one, I think, where, where pulmonary and the ICU people are, would be interested. They are recommending add corticosteroids in the form of dexamethasone for six weeks at the start of TB therapy. This is now no longer HIV. We're talking about just meningitis in general. Um, and at the start of TB ther therapy for TB meningitis. And then this is one of the two recommendations, other than what I already discussed, about extending TB therapy to nine months because of greater chance of relapse. So TB meningitis. I'm also going to say that these are the cases where I'm inching up the rifampin dose uh, because rifampins are, you know, our best first-line drug. At, you know, I so is isoniazid at uh, rapid sterilization of the uh, of the um, whatever it is. In, in this case, the CSF, and because of the brain, the blood-brain barrier, you want to get the drug in. So um, I think you could consider even giving a larger dose of rifampin until the patient stabilizes. TB pericarditis, they say the corticosteroids should not be routinely given, but in selected cases may be appropriate. Large effusions, high levels of inflammatory cells or markers in the fluid. Um, that's the interferon gamma, the ADA, um, which you look at with pleural effusions sometimes, and early signs of, con of constriction. So extrapulmonary TB, conditions in which to extend therapy to nine months. You guys gave me this patient. This is a, a, um, a, a, a very unfortunate young man. And you can see just a little bit of his spine and his paraspinous muscles um, just eaten away by tuberculosis. So this man came into the, he was, I think, in one of the family practice clinics or medicine clinics. They uh, very rapidly got him imaged, and then they sent him to the ER here. And uh, the ER right away got him, uh, you know, had some of this drained and sent for TB. Um, he was started on, on therapy immediately. The health department was called right away. So Henry Ford did a just absolutely superb job on this patient, but this is how he showed up in the, in the ER, in the, in the clinic. Um, so I just put this in as an interesting x-ray. Um, so the meningitis, bone, joint, and spine disease I have another patient um, also with uh, something like this, and the paraspinous muscle went into his hip. Um, you know, at the same time, I'm treating both of these patients. And I just got notified that in the Henry Ford system in one of the suburban hospitals, they've got somebody with granulomatous disease, high-risk patient in the cervical spine. So I've got three spine patients at once in Detroit. So um, what do you do with follow-up and evaluations um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, how do you monitor these patients? Um, this, this is a screenshot that I fixed up a little bit of, of what's in the article. The, the red stuff is in the bottom is mine. The shaded boxes are optional or contingent on other information. Um, and this is what you need to do. And notice there's no bronchoscopy here. So it's sputum smears and culture and drug susceptibility testing baseline, some imaging, 
A clinical assessment weight um, is a very good indicator of whether people are responding to their drugs. We want a baseline weight. You also need that to get your dosing. Symptoms and adherence review. Um, I don't do these vision assessments, but that's what they recommend. I don't think we use enough ethambutol to do, to do that. If you're using it for a long time in high doses, yes, or the patient already has eye disease or something like that. Um, liver function test, platelet count, creatinine, um, and HIV tests are self-evident. You do not have to screen them for diabetes and hepatitis B and C. Um, and then you do want to get the sputums, and this one is key over here, that two-month. We want to know what they're doing at that two-month period so we know how long to treat. And then um, once they turn negative, you can stop. The, turning, the, the do, following the sputum also has to do with how long we keep people in isolation. Um, and then I do repeat the x-ray at the end of treatment because it forms a new baseline so I know what's new in the future and what was due to his TB at the end of treatment. They say it's optional. Um, the weight and the symptom review at every visit, um, and they drop out the vision testing because I think they assume that most people are not going to need the ethambutol. And then you do not need to do liver function tests. There's no reason to do liver function tests. Uh, we do not do liver function tests. Uh, much more important is instruct the patient to notify you if they lose their appetite or they're not doing well, they have a rash, they're itching, you know, etc. And ask them at every visit. And when we do DOT, our DOT workers ask them with every dose of medicines. So, um, so other issues that they address that I'm not going over is they have a wonderful um, section on treatment failure, adverse effects of TB medicines, drug-drug interactions, therapeutic drug monitoring, children, pregnant and nursing women, kidney disease and hepatic disease. I'm definitely not going over those with you. And I just want to just very quickly go through the PICOS questions that they asked. Uh, some of them I've already discussed. And just so that you know what the nine recommendations are with regard to their uh, PICOS um, evaluation. So again, the, the population is the patients with suspect with or suspected of having drug-susceptible TB, um, special circumstances um, that are listed there, and I mentioned before. The intervention that I gave to you in this talk is the DOT, uh, the comparators, again, whatever the comparators are, and the outcomes could be, for instance, percent to relapse uh, would be one example of an outcome. Um, so one. Does case management intervention uh, improve outcomes? They do make a conditional recommendation with very low um, certainty in the evidence. Um, I already did the um, SAT versus DOT, which is number two. Number three, does intermittent dosing in the intensive phase have similar outcomes compared to daily um, dosing? And I am not going to um, go over the reasons for it. They have a very long discussion of how they came to their conclusion. And remember, they did do that conditional, and it was low, you know, it, it was uh, low um, evidence. Um, and then does intermittent dosing, the same question for the intermittent dosing. Number five, does extending treatment beyond six months um, um, improve outcomes in patients co-infected with HIV and B? And I went over that. That's the five A and B. Conditional recommendation, very low certainty in the evidence. And then um, the one that's got the strongest recommendation is when to start the antiretroviral therapy. The seven is the adjuvant uh, corticosteroids. I mentioned that already. Conditional recommendation, very low evidence, certainty. And then do adjuvant corticosteroids and meningitis provide mortality and morbidity benefits? And here they say moderate <coughs> certainty in the evidence. Um, so that for them is a strong recommendation um, because everything else is low or very low. Um, and does shorter duration of treatment in HIV negative individuals with posse bacillary TB, that means smear negative or culture negative, and or ne culture negative, have similar outcomes compared to six-month therapy. Conditional recommendation, very low certainty in the evidence. So my patient number one who had his bronchoscopy, let's say, let's say they, that it never grew out tuberculosis, and let's say he had a positive quantiferin, which he did have. Um, and let's say you just never grew out TB, but he's got that. You should have, you know, he should have been treated even on that basis. 
And when he had that very early disease, maybe four months of therapy would be sufficient for him. But you have to individualize that. Does that make sense? And remember, you don't have to have TB organism to diagnose TB and to treat. About 16% of pulmonary TB cases that are accepted and verified by the CDC as a case never had a positive culture for TB and, and didn't, didn't have a PCR positive for TB. These are clinical TB or culture negative TB. Yes, and clinical TB would be so another. Yeah. What, are the, what, are, what is the clinical picture? And so what we know is cavitary lung lesion. Inter, uh, patient patient or, number one that I presented had granulomas on his biopsy, yeah. high risk context. He's a high risk. In Detroit, he's a high risk patient. Um, and uh, positive. Uh, so usually these patients are, uh, it's based on a positive uh, interferon gamma release assay the T-spot or the quantifiron, or a positive TB skin test, especially if they have never received the BCG vaccine. So would the same apply? That's a clinical case. That sure. would be a clinical case here. Would the same apply for cirrhositis with, like, granuloma on the yes. oral biopsy? Yes, 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 in any, in any source. And by the way, we do sputum for AFB, smear and culture. On extra pulmonary TB, many of them will have positive, um, you know, cultures or even smears and cultures. Many of them will have. So, I mean, it's, it's a minority, but it helps us know what to do about contact investigations. Yeah. For the slide where you showed the um, decision to treat and decision not to treat. Yeah, I love that. It's my favorite slide. What happens when you have features on both sides? You just put it where it, You know, it's a clinical diagnosis, and I would say the most important thing is this a person who is high risk for having been infected with TB? Um, there, you know, the QFT or the T-spot will tell you that. Um, and a high risk for progressing to disease. Um, somebody that, here's a health department look at it. So I have a patient who I know is going to be difficult to um, you know, to let's say treat for LTBI. You know, he's just, he, he's not going to be cooperative. As soon as I label him tuberculosis and say I'm treating him and I report him to the state as a TB case, then I have control over him. I say, I can, I can, you know, do DOT. I can get somebody to his house every day. I can, I have the authority to actually give him this TB even if he doesn't want it. I can't force it down his mouth. But I can say, you know what, we can quarantine you when you get sick or you take your medicine. So that helps. Does that help? So all those issues are going to go into that decision making. And how certain are you that the x-ray looks like this? Do you have alternative diagnoses? How sick is he? How sick would he be? Is he on Humira? You know, those kind of things. Does that, does that answer the question? It does. Okay. Yeah. Clinical. Brain. <laughs> Two questions. Uh, I understand the don't have to check liver tests if patients are asymptomatic. I've had a couple of patients, actually more than a couple, latent TB, been given INH, where this serendipity got lab work done for other reasons a month or two later with enzymes over a thousand. They felt fine at that point. Now, theoretically, they never should have drawn it. Should just keep giving the therapy. I lost my nerve and I, you know, switched into rifampin at that point from INH. Mm -hmm. But I mean. I'm a little nervous about that recommendation, not to spot check it, though I understand the vast majority of people do fine. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen those at all? Well, I'm going to tell you that, um, you know, for instance, talking to this patient really carefully, if you're not eating as well, if you have any kind of pain up here, um, with an enzyme out of a thousand, I, you know, I, I, it's hard to believe that there's no symptoms or, <clears throat> or no even slight icterus. Um, then I would say if you're going to do what interval? You're going to do monthly liver function tests. What do you do two weeks after he had his liver function tests? It's not a substitute for you know the education of the patient. And I'd rather the patient be looking at his symptoms twice a day than you doing the liver tests and have it be an excuse not to really talk to the patient. Well, now these are very you know, no history. Yeah. So that sickness all on those. So, uh, yeah. but anyway, the other thing I was going to mention too is that my original patient I mentioned that with TB, mm -hmm. it was the health department of Mount Clemens that refused treatment. 
what are my options then? You know, they just, their doctors didn't think it was necessary at that point. But you can, you can say, you know, really you, you can just escalate it up to the health department and say, could you just check this patient out? You but know, that was it, the health department, wasn't it? Not Clements, uh, that's where they get the TV. Oh, you're that. saying the health department. So then the you're health department. Then you're in, <laughs> now, I thought you meant it was a hospital in there. No, no, it was the health department of Mount Clements, our regional office. I mean, who you escalate to after that? Yeah, they, they've had doctor problems. I know, they've had, yeah. they've been, I found out. they've had doctor <laughs> problems. <laughs> Ask them what you know. What you can do, you I call can, the state land you can, you can go to Jim Sunstrom, who's the uh, TB, you know, advisor, consultant for the state, or you can go to the Mayo Clinics. Uh, you know, that's the regional training center, and get it. You, you can do that even anonymously. Can you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then they will call the state and get the state involved. So I call Lansing. I don't know if anything. Right yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. Um, so I think. Um, the last one was, that's a shorter duration of tree. Oh, I, thought I already did that. So that's it, basically. And I have a pretty picture. So any other comments or questions? I, I don't know. This is not, well, maybe a more appropriate for ID, but I think you guys see enough of this that you should at least be aware of what's, you know, what's going on. And those of you who are taking boards, I, I presume there's going to be a few TB questions. Mm -hmm. Especially clinical TB before it's, Confirmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the confirmed ones are a little easier, right? Yeah. So, just for this scenario, so a, a patient with your thought was going to be culture pretty negative, you started the treatment. Um, while down the line, uh, it's been two months you've been treating them, they feel the same, the imaging that you were concerned yeah. about didn't they actually change yeah. much and they don't feel any better. Yeah, so... Do you start looking at two months alternate diagnosis and yeah. stop the treatment? Yeah, so, so you know, a, a lot of times it's just that they have an abnormal chest x-ray and kind of, you know, vague stuff and you don't know what this x-ray is due to. It's And so what you can do, it's really nice, at the end of the two months you can say, okay, right for the first two months I called them suspected TB. And now I'm just going to say he's treated latent TB infection, but it's already been treated. Now he doesn't even have latent TB infection. He has a former TB infection or a cured TB infection. <coughs> yeah, so, so we had this guy, um, actually another Henry Ford patient. So this is kind of an interesting guy. This guy is an out and out and out alcoholic, lives in an abandoned house with his uh, brother. And uh, he's just drunk all the time. And so he falls, and then he hits his head, and he's had a lot of trauma. He's got plates here, he's had craniotomies here, and at this point now he just doesn't, he doesn't think right at all. And uh, so he comes into Henry Ford about four years ago in crisis, and he's septic, and he's in the ICU you know, with ARDS and on a ventilator for months. Believe me, his chest x-ray is not normal. So he shows up at Oakwood and he's got a positive QFT and I get talked into treating him for TB because we can't prove he's not TB because we have to wait eight weeks for his cultures to come back and everything. And he is a pain in the neck to treat. He's in and out of the hospital, he has seizures, he's drinking, we can't find him. We do get a couple of months of therapy in him. And of course nothing has changed. I have an alternative diagnosis. He was here, I have your x-rays, they look the same as they, you know, they do then. Ah. His latent TB is, treat, is, is treated, I've waited for his cultures, they're all negative, I changed it to LTBI. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> you know, and then other people, you say, they're having no problem. I could go to the two day a week, you know, I could go to treatment regimen number four, it's real easy, and I could finish them up in just a few doses. So, you know, it depends. It's again, the clinical judgment and, you know, thinking about the patient. And, using common sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the <laughs> I appreciate the attention and I love coming here so no, we love having you. <laughs> thank you so much.